Hi, welcome to Wet Pixel Live. My name is Adam Handler, and I'm the editor of Wet Pixel. I'd like to introduce you to Alexeyevich. Hello, Alexeyevich. Hi, Adam. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't remember from um, what hello in Russian was. So. Uh, no, I was. So, it's Dos for Daniel's goodbye, isn't it? Anyway, <laughs> never mind. Uh, so, um, so uh, we're going to talk today about fluorescence, and as is usually the place, the case, I'm going to throw the hot potato over to Alex and ask him what is fluorescence photography. Um, well, I think fluorescence photography really interests underwater photographers because it gives them the opportunity to create a completely new and different type of image, yeah. particularly in an area maybe where they dive a lot and it's kind of they feel like they're, they're seeing the same subjects again and again. Um, and so it, it is a really interesting area to understand. And it's actually a very completely different type of, of, of image making. It is, so yeah. it is really interesting to yeah. understand. Um, so fluorescence... Well, I think first of all, to explain how, how normal light works and how we, we normally take photos of reflected light. Yeah. So I'm, I'm wearing a red T-shirt. Um, you see that as red because white light falls on the T-shirt. The T-shirt has those, those red hues in it. And then the red light is bounced back towards you. Yeah. Um, and that, that's how you, you see, see red light. Where, how fluorescence works is fluorescence, the light, the, the pigments in the whatever the material is, whether it's a living thing or whether it's uh, artificial pigments, the pigments absorb light from one wavelength and admit it at another wavelength. So you can't see fluorescence without having light on the subject. Um, so for um, and what we typically see underwater is subjects absorb blue light or ultraviolet light and admit that at at um, at shorter wavelengths, yeah. at sort of oranges and yellows and greens. Yeah. Um, come out, and it creates um, and it allows you to create really interesting images using this phenomenon. If you've ever been to sort of a, a nightclub or a disco with with you know it's certainly in the eighties um, and nineties <laughs> where they had a lot of fluorescent UV lights, you yeah. know you'd have t-shirts that would glow, you know you'd have very bright oranges, and that's the fluorescent pigment. So you could see that orange in normal light, yeah. but that fluorescent orange or fluorescent pink would then glow really brightly under that light. Yeah. I think. It's Fluorescence can be confused a lot with bioluminescence or luminescence. Yeah. And luminescence is where a, a material or a compound is generating light. Yeah. Fluorescence doesn't generate light. It doesn't glow in the dark. It only it absorbs light at one wavelength and then creates light at another wavelength. So you can shine a blue light on a subject and you'll get green or orange or yellow back yeah. um, or red or, or whatever um, from it. Um, and you can, as a photographer, photograph that and create very different images. And I think what's exciting about the underwater world is that there are lots and lots of subjects that fluoresce and yep. we're still finding more and more. Yep. And it's allowing people to create really interesting and very unusual images. Yep. And I, I would, for me, I find it a little bit of a, a one trick pony. Yep. I find I've enjoyed doing fluorescence photography in the past but I'm not really itching to do it all the time. Yeah. I do constantly meet people who love it and they do it as much as they possibly can and they cre continually create pictures they really love and other people who like look at the pictures and go, ah, it's not for me at all and have never, never tried it, not got any intention of trying it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I would say is, first of all, you need um, two things to photograph fluorescence. One is a light source to excite that fluorescence and the other is a barrier filter to block out the wavelengths of light you don't want and allow the camera to photograph the fluorescent wavelengths coming Coming through coming without the, the other light. Yeah, yeah. And the, the typical way we do that is we use blue or, or ultraviolet light to generate the fluorescence response from the subject. Yeah. And then we use a yellow barrier filter on the camera which, which blocks it out. So this is a barrier filter that I use um, this is a 67 mil thread one, so it, it screws on the front of my macro lenses. Yeah. Or I can actually, uh, this is 62, but I also have a 67 one, yeah. which I can also put on the outside of the housing right. if I want to take it on and off during the dive. This is the, the, the on, on lens one. Yeah. And you can see if I put it in front of the camera, everything goes yellow. It does indeed. What this stops doing is it stops the blue light or the, and the ultraviolet light from coming through. There's not much blue in my background. Maybe there's a little bit of blue on the, um, on the hand prints behind my head. If I put that on the camera, you'll see that those yeah, all those colours now go black. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the outside of the edges, yeah. and, and that has the same effect. So you you wash the whole scene in blue light, and then you you broke it off with this. Um, how you generate the excitation light 
depends really on what you're using as a light source. Yep. Um, some photographers like using UV continuous lights. It's yep. hard to create UV from strobe lights. Yep. So people use, you know, powerful um, LED torches. Video either with, lights. With yeah. UV bulbs in them yep. or with filtration to really get the UV out of normal bulbs. Yep. Um, or you use your standard strobes and then fit strobe filters to them. And I've got a couple here. Um, there's kind of three brands that I've tried. I'm sure there are others out there. Um, the first one that I was aware of is Nightsea, who make this yep. filter. It's yep. got a reflective coating, but if I hold it up, you'll see it's just a super strong blue. It is, yeah, yeah. Um, this one is made by Glowdive, um, another company. Again, it's just a super strong blue yep. filter. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've actually also made my own filters um, yep. myself. I actually just bought a little book of free filter gel or got a little book of free filter gels from Lee Filters, looked at the absorption spectrums and just cut out a couple of the really strong blue ones and sandwiched them together and they work perfectly well as well. Um, the other company that makes filters is uh, that I'm aware of is Firedive and they actually all make them to slightly different recipes. Yeah. And that's actually quite interesting as a photographer because people who are into it often own all of them because with different subjects, they all have, different have slightly different effects and create yeah. can create some really quite different colors. Yeah. Also, people who are really into it do experiment with their barrier filters as well yeah. to change the color and look of the subject. So, it isn't a case of there's a correct or an incorrect way of doing it. You don't want the picture to end up all blue, so yeah. you do need some sort of barrier filter or all UV. Um, but actually, in terms of the colors you want, you really just want to create a colorful, different, attractive result. Yeah. So people who get into it really enjoy experimenting yeah. with different types of excitation and different types of barrier. Filters. Maybe a silly question, Alex, but do you do this in daytime or nighttime? Um, you can do it in either, but you definitely want low ambient light levels. Right. So I shoot quite a lot of fluorescent photography in our home waters in the UK. There's lots of nice fluorescent subjects. Um, our dual anemones are amazing. They've got loads of color in them. Yeah. Uh, light bulb tunicates as well. Really, really nice. They're just as UK subjects. Yeah. Um, and in the UK, it's dark enough to do those shots in the daytime. Right. Um, but if you're a tropical reef diver and you want to shoot corals, typically it's a, it, people do it at night. Yeah. Um, it's easier to find subjects at night um, you know, the other thing, you know, the thing is finding subjects that fluoresce. Yep. You typically want to then use a, at least a blue torch or if not a UV torch and swim around and look for subjects that fluoresce. But they're they're quite back easy at you. to find. You can swim yeah. quite fast looking for them. Yeah. And then when you see something that's creating interesting colors, you can then go in and shoot it. Yeah. But you, you do need to find the right subjects. And what is unusual is that fluorescence, you know, we, we know certain animals fluoresce, you know, um, Cat sharks in the UK, moray eels, um, you know, some crustaceans, lots and lots of subjects have fluorescence, but it's not consistent between individuals. Yep. So it's not just a case of saying, right, I've got to find um, a, a, that subject on, 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 and I'll know I'll get a good fluorescent shot. Yep. You actually also need to check different individuals because some individuals have a strong fluorescence yep. and some have a very weak fluorescence, and that can make a big difference to your shots. It's been muted that there might be some, some kind of communication, isn't it, that, that there may actually be some kind of some kind of communication method between interspecies or intraspecies. Um, yeah. But yeah, I have to say, unproven. <laughs> with my, 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 my scientist hat on, I know that there's, you know, there's lots of good scientific applications of using fluorescence. It's great for counting new coral recruits and that sort of thing. And yeah. um, in terms of why it's in animals, I sit pretty skeptically on the fence of it actually having really any big practical benefit. There are a couple of exceptions I'll come on to. Um, and actually for me, it's more about, um, it's maybe just a side effect of, yeah. of other processes in the cell that this pigment gets produced and there's fluorescence. I'm not right. convinced that the fluorescence itself is something the animal is aiming for. Yeah. It's just the byproduct of maybe those compounds are useful for something else. Yeah. Um, all that said, there are some examples where it actually is really valuable to the, to the animals. Um, I have a, a, a well-known picture of uh, nudibranch. Um, maybe we can, we can get it up on screen and, and, and I'll, I'll show you. Um, and, and this picture of nudibranch is, is well-known from the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. And this species of nudibranch actually has fluorescent pigment in those orange rhinophores in the yeah, does, yeah. Um, yeah. And that's actually a fluorescent pigment. And what that's valuable to the animal is normally at depth, orange wouldn't show up very much because there's no white light to make it, it light up. It shows up great in our flashlight photos. Yeah, yeah. But because that is a fluorescent pigment, actually that, that orange does really show up well at depth because that pigment is absorbing the blue light that's naturally at that depth yeah. and emitting it at orange. 
Yeah. And that helps these warning colors of the nudibranch stand out at depth. Yeah. So it's actually, this, this animal is using fluorescence in a, in a really valuable, valuable It's, it's the equivalent of, the, of all the, the uh, reflective signs on a police car or, or a, yeah. an ambulance. Yeah. It's drawing yeah, attention, saying, back off. The the, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think a couple of other things I wanted to mention about, about shooting fluorescence is sort of more technical stuff is because you're dealing with this emitted light, you need a lot of light to excite fluorescence. Yeah. So, you know, if, you, if you're really into it, it might be worth buying two continuous, big continuous torches. The more powerful, the better. Yeah. Um, if you're doing it with strobes, you definitely want to use multiple strobes. Yeah. You definitely want to use a macro lens that gets you as close to the subject as possible. Yeah. As, a, as a full frame shooter, I tend not to do this with the 105. I tend to shoot it with a 60, 60 yeah. so that I can end up really close to the subject. All those things, and I quite often shoot with three strobes, and right. I'll have three strobes wrapped around my thing just to give me as much light as possible. Yep. Because you're basically you're putting a really strong filter on the strobe that cuts most of the light out from the strobe, and then you're putting a really strong filter on the lens that cuts most of that light out yep. to get back in. Yep. So you generally want to work with a slightly higher ISO and as much strobe power as possible. I typically go in my strobes just turned up to full. Um, and, and work from there. As I've, seen, I've seen the guys using uh, some of the big Keldan video lights. Yeah. Um, they actually do a, fl a fluorescence version or a fluorescence chip for it. Um, yeah, that would be really nice. And, and I mean, yeah. they're really, really, really super bright and they yeah, great results. Yeah. 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 A couple of other things that, that are interesting about fluorescence photography, because it's not reflected light photography, hmm. you don't have an issue with backscatter hmm. because you it, backscatter doesn't fluoresce, so you don't yeah. see it. Yeah. I mean, if you've got very silty water, you will see the, the particles. Yeah. But you won't, but they'll be black, not white. So yeah. they're not very distracting, especially yeah. on a black background. Yeah. Um, and also strobe positioning doesn't affect the light on the subject yeah. because the light's being emitted, not reflected. Yeah. So, you know, if we want to create texture on a subject or shadows, we may move a strobe to the side and that sort of thing. That doesn't affect reflect, um, fluorescent light. It's not, yeah. you know, doesn't really, people aren't really thinking about that when they shoot fluorescence. But yeah. actually moving your strobes around makes no difference to the shot. Yeah. So actually, you don't really want to have your normal strobe positions. You actually want everything tucked in as tight as possible to the to camera. Just to get as much light as power. possible. Yeah, yeah. And there's no need to worry about backscatter. Yeah. So just your strobe positions are slightly different when, you, when you're doing it. Yeah. But yeah, the key things are, you know, are that you, you want to have, you, you need to find the right subjects, really. Yeah. Um, a lot of corals fluoresce, but they fluoresce in a pretty monochrome green. Yeah, and I think it's it's more interesting to find subjects that have yellows and oranges and reds in them, yeah. um, and a mix of colours creates really nice pictures. Yeah. Um, I think we don't normally talk about about processing in in these. We typically leave talking about processing to to Erin's one. Erin, yeah, yeah. Like ask Aaron. But I do think you can enhance your fluorescent photography by being quite rough with your processing. You know, pushing the colours a bit with white balance, um, tweaking the contrast up. I think can really help and the clarity can really help these shots jump out and give them a bit more oomph because they can be a little bit flat out yeah. of the camera. Yeah. But yeah. hopefully that's given you a pretty good introduction to it as, a, as an idea. That's an excellent primer, Alex. Thank you very much. Um, and, you know, obviously, um, uh, fluorescent photography, can that, is that a search tag in your, on your website? Yeah. Yeah. I'll generally always write fluorescence. It's not something that overly interests me, so I don't have loads of pictures. There are lots of really good pictures out there online. I'd maybe suggest actually go on Instagram yep. and actually yeah, search for fluorescence. I imagine you, you'll find a lot of stuff. Yep. Um, maybe you maybe also need to search fluorescence and underwater because you might get all sorts of things on Instagram. Yeah. All, the night, all the nightclub stuff we spoke about earlier. Yeah, um, yeah that's brilliant. Thank you, Alex. Um, so um, thank you all for watching, and thanks to Backscatter Photo and Video for sponsoring this episode. Um, please feel free to um, uh, like this video and to add comments in the suggestions box underneath for any topics you'd like us to cover in the future. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you next week.